Um, many of them have done it for purposes of uh, quality improvement, reducing practice variation, empowering patients, um, um, uh, uh, or uh, uh, do it for who knows what. And our, our path has been somewhat different in our objectives and our approaches. And I think we've come up, we've come up into show decision making in a different way, and we're going in a different direction now, <coughs> further. Um, so um, I don't think even our own group has actually come to terms really with that new direction, but we're going to try to rehearse it this morning. To get, take us on this journey, um, Ian Hargraves, uh, Maggie Presley, and Juan Pablo Victor are going to um, do this uh, for us. Um, mostly Ian and Juan Pablo now, and then in the next session, the three of them in a, in a workshop format. Um, uh, Ian is a PhD designer, interaction designer. Um, uh, you heard, uh, some of you heard him yesterday talk about uh, care, the myth of care, and that was part of uh, his dissertation, connecting health healthcare and design, and uh, identifying how uh, they may be part of a, a discipline of fashioning in people's lives, mm -hmm. uh, thoughtfully fashioning people's lives. Um, uh, he's our, uh, our lead designer at the CARE unit and happens to be also our lead philosopher at the CARE unit. Juan Pablo Brito is a, an endocrinologist, and not by now you will probably have realized that most brilliant people are endocrinologists. <laughs> um, uh, he's an endocrinologist uh, who um, uh, is now the medical director for a, uh, the Mayo Clinic uh, Shared Decision Making Research, National Resource Center. Juan Pablo is responsible for the activities of developing and integrating <coughs> decision-making interventions for clinical practice um, and uh, uh, leads our group uh, in these new directions in shared decision-making. So you're going to be in good hands for this morning and uh, to start off, uh, I think Ian is going to take on. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see you all again. Um, today we're going to talk about shared decision-making as Victor mentioned. And, um, Shared decision making is, is both a familiar concept and, and a difficult idea to pick up at the same time. Traditionally, if I was going to talk about shared decision making, I may well begin by turning towards the medical literature and pointing out the wealth of uncertainty that resides in that explicit body. The many things that medicine doesn't know and how we make decisions in the absence of adequate information. Another traditional starting point for thinking about shared decision making would be to turn to the patient and the recognition <coughs> that today patients have many more choices, many more options than they have at other times in their past, uh, in the past, and how might we help these patients make sense of the many options that they have. But today I'm going to start instead with this deck of cards. I'm going to start with a deck of cards any cards, can't play poker with these cards. These are a set of cards that were put together by Kerry Sparling. Um, we had the good pleasure to um, have her visit with us recently. She's a type 1 diabetic, has lived with diabetes for, for well over 20 years. She's an advocate in this space, and as part of her work, she's put together a set of what she calls empathy cards, or cards for humanity. <laughs> the idea of these cards is to help um, support conversations around what life with diabetes is like. And this is one of the cards that she uses in her book. It says, it's a bedtime for the kids and you have gathered them for a story. The words on the page get fuzzy and your glucose monitor is alerting you to low blood sugar. But the kids are nestled in your lap and you don't want to scare them. Mm. Can you feel that? Mm. We're talking about empathy, these are empathy cards. Mm -hmm. I'm not just imagining mm -hmm. what it must, like, must be like to live with diabetes, something that I don't. Mm. What Kerry is doing is putting me in a situation in which the problems of living with diabetes are palpable. I can imagine losing my ability to, to think clearly as I would like, whilst continuing the obligation to care for my children as they sit on my lap waiting for me to read. 
not only can I empathize, I recognize that this is a problem. Something needs to be done here. It's not enough to just recognize, well, oh, this sucks. No, Carrie, with the kids on her lap, actually has to do something at this point. And so she asks us, what, what do you do? How do you deal with this situation? What are you going to do? And then she closes it with another question. How do you balance parenting and self-care in this moment? In this moment, how do you figure out what's best for you? And how do you figure out what's best for, you, for your family? The problem of living with diabetes. These problems of living with diabetes are the problems of diabetes that turn up in our clinic. We don't go to people's living rooms and lift children off labs or read books for stories. But we are facing those sorts of lived problems when we're dealing with diabetes here. We like to think in healthcare that our problems are relatively clean, a problemless, we have a good sense of what the issues are, all very nice and tidy. Each problem has a general um, region of appropriate actions, let's pick the right one, you can be on your way, I can be on my way. But the truth is that many of the situations in healthcare are just as confused and troubling and problematic as the situation of Gary sitting with her kid on her lap trying to It's a difficult situation. Something needs to be done. What it is that needs to be done is far from clear. these sorts of problematic situations that lead to medicine being a history of people turning to other people and asking for help with this question. In this crappy situation, what's best for me? Can you help me? Well, I think that Maria Luisa, who um, Victor introduced us to yesterday. Similarly, she's dealing with a physical situation. What that situation is, not entirely clear. What would you do about it? Also not clear. What's clear is that something needs to happen. How do we get at what needs to happen? And how would we approach what's best to do in these sorts of things? How do we get at what's best? For Maria Luisa, for Terry, patients in general. Well, one traditional approach for figuring out what's best is you go and ask the person who knows what's best. This handsome gentleman here, <laughs> clearly, is equipped with with insight as to what the best thing to do is. And so if we were just to ask him, respect his advice, we'd be well on his way. There's a certain amount of truth there. This guy spent many years getting himself in a position where he had some claim to understand what best might be. It also, um, but the critique of this approach is it's paternalistic doesn't honor the fact that um, what's best for a person isn't something that simply relies on the expertise of the clinician. It actually has to make sense in the person's life. If we wanted to find what's best for, for patients in general, we could turn to guidelines, codified expressions, highly refined distillations of what the medical evidence has said is the best thing to do. Another common approach. The problem with both of these approaches is that they are means of answering the question of what's best for people like Maria Luisa, but they're not great tools for answering the question what's best for Maria Luisa herself. Another common approach in recognizing the limitation of, 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 of guidelines and clinical artistry is to turn to the patient themselves. So 
surely Maria Luisa is one who knows what's best for her. So let's give her that power. Let's give her the information that she needs so that she can figure out what's best for her. Let's make sure that she's aware that she has choices. Lay them out in front of her and never too. The problem with that approach, which seems to make a lot of sense, is what Maria Luisa is dealing with is her, is her life, not a lack of information or a lack of choice. It's not clear that coming to Terry as she sits with her kids on her lap, with a nice handout for her to read, or a list of things that she could do in this difficult situation, would actually be a very helpful way of getting her through. So how do we arrive at what's best for patients? Well, in our work, we think we have a glimpse of two strategies that seem to show some promise. The first strategy is that if you want to figure out what's best, you talk with the people involved and you try to find agreement on what's best for them. Another approach to finding what's best is to work through the situation. The idea of this is we're trying to fashion a course of action for the people involved that makes intellectual, practical, and emotional sense. How do we prove to ourselves that the thing we think we might do makes sense for you in your situation is going to help you? In our work, we think both of these approaches happen in conversation. They're both conversational approaches. They involve two people, typically in, the, in our world, a clinician and a patient, coming together either to talk to reach an agreement or talk to prove to themselves that this is the right course of action for this situation. <coughs> So what does this talk with the person approach look like? <coughs> Basically it's about people speaking <coughs> what matters to them. If this is going to work, I have to be able to hear what matters to you, and you have to be able to listen to what matters to me. Doctor, patient, come from very different worlds, different things are important to them, each needs a space where they can speak to what matters to them. And so as we're designing or practicing conversation, what we're trying to do is create and maintain a relationship where, where this coming together of two distinctly different individuals is possible in such a way that these two parties can come to a point of agreement. And so this is an example what that might look like. So yes, I agree. We need to make sure your sugars are better controlled. Um, so that means we need a new medication. So which aspect of your next study's medication do you want to discuss first? Weight change. Weight change? Let's review that. This is the one that I Yeah, you're already on the form. Uh, this one was 15. Yeah, that one is going to help you lose some weight. Yeah. What aspect of your of that medication would you like to learn? Um, I'd say the daily routine. Sure. Yeah. Also, this is an injectable. Yeah, it's actually very easy. There are a couple of pens that have needles, and, and you inject the needle in, into your belly and do that twice a day before your meals. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't think I really want. You, you don't want to go to needles? No, no. I'm much better. Mm. So, this is okay. Well, then, so this got self on your ears. That's the, that's the next best one, one for you in terms of the weight, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the daily pill, so that you can start with just one pill a day. Yeah, and just 30 minutes beforehand. Yeah, usually 30 minutes before breakfast. Is that, would that be okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, the other thing to consider is that sometimes they can give you low blood sugar, so we're going to ask you to monitor a little more often than you're doing right now, but otherwise that would be okay. Mm -hmm. If you were to change your mind after you go home, I'll give you this pamphlet. It has the same thing as the cards, 
So as you're using the tablet, if you find that it's not what you're expecting, you can review this again and give me a call and we can discuss it again. Okay. All right, thank you.